Well, good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to worship with you guys this morning. Um, just This is just an honor for me to be here with Merle and Cherie, your, your church. We met last year. Um, if I need to reposition my mic, let, let me know. Get closer. Is that better? A little better? Um, we met last year, and it was a quick, really quick heart-to-heart -heart connect, um, just hearing some of their story. Uh, well, it first started, we met at this, this meeting, a business gathering, and uh, we just got introduced, and uh, Merle walked out, and then he came back and said, hey, do you mind if I pray for you? I feel like I have a word for you. I'm like, I like this guy, you know. Um, so we became quick friends, and then we heard a little bit of their story, and it was amazing, our our family story parallels a little bit with yours, similarities in, in the call to missions and nations and everything, and then moving back here um, in 2017 is when we came back. Um, just a little bit about me, I'm originally from India, uh, so I love seeing that being the nation that's really marked up for Dove. Um, and I was born in India, but I grew up in, in the Middle East in Dubai. And then I came to Pennsylvania to go to Maasai College, early 90s. Um, so anyone, any Maasai grads here? A few hands. Awesome. Um, and then I kind of stuck around. So I went, I started going to Life Center in Harrisburg uh, because they sent a van and I got in one of the vans and, <laughs> and I walked in. I was like, what is this? It was amazing. Um, I grew up in an Orthodox, Christian Orthodox background. Uh, and didn't go to church, didn't like going to church, because they were like four hours long, um, and it was in a Syrian language, not even in our language, so no one knew what was going on. But, um, but I knew that my, when I wouldn't go to church, my parents would go, and you know, in this Orthodox church, they use incense a lot, and the whole place is smoked with incense. But when my parents would come back, if I didn't go to church, they would come back, I'd open the door, smelling incense on their clothes would convict me. Wow. As, a, as a teenager, I'm like... I don't like this feeling, you know. Anyway, those are all like God's, um, you know, plan, even when, when I wasn't ready or wanting to. Um, and then from Messiah College, I just stayed connected um, to the church for, so I've been part of the church for 30 years at Life Center and just stayed connected with the leaders um, and mo moved overseas end of 99 after working after college for four years um, I felt this call for missions, and I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, moved to Cyprus, where Sarah's family had moved as well, and uh, it started a missions base. Uh, we, we got married there, um, and then God brought us back to the U.S. for a period of time. We led a Bible school here uh, at Life Center for six years, and then we thought, this is it. This is our final move. We moved back to Cyprus with her family ministry. All of her siblings are there. Um, on this beautiful island, amazing beaches around, up in the mountains. We were living the life. I mean, it was a, it, if you were to do missions perfectly, this would be what you should do. Um, and um, worship every morning, six months out of the year, we were traveling as a family in mission somewhere. We literally lived out of suitcases, and it didn't feel like that till after we came out of that season. We're like, we lived in, out of our suitcases for six months out of the year. Um, Anyway, we thought we were in Cyprus for years to come, uh, long term, and then sovereignly God redirected our path, our, our steps, and brought us back to Harrisburg and Life Center. So we're, we're really happy to, to be here with you and, and uh, build on just a sweet friendship uh, with your pastors. This mo and this morning, I, want, I simply want to come and encourage who you are as a church. I know that there's, you're in a season of transition as far as leadership. Um, and this is a solid, safe place where God has built uh, a good work in his body among the Dove churches. And I simply want to come and bring a wave of encouragement to your hearts. Is that okay? I'm not going to preach anything new that you don't know, but I do want to bring encouragement, you know. And, and uh, it's, it's like a marathon runner. The runner has done all the training and all the years of, you know, working hard. And there are people that are so important to the race that just never raced in their life and, you know, standing on the, in the sideline with drinks along the way. So I just want to be that the fresh encouragement to you uh, as a church. And I feel for us, 
uh, as a body of Christ in the, in the era or that we're, the time frame that we're living in, we can't just have church and just be Christians and just be nominal. We're just doing what we can or the minimum that we need to be to look like a church, act like a church, talk like a church. We have to live in such a way that we are advancing the kingdom of God. And you don't have to be Heidi Baker or Bill Johnson or whoever your heroes might be. You don't have to be. We, have, we can be normal people, living normal lives, having normal families, but our expectation is on the Lord. If our input is mundane, our activity is mundane and our output is mundane. What if our input and our expectation for our lives is hope that is set on the Lord? That is anchored in eternity and it's wanting to make its way to the earth through us. The mystery of God is that he works on the earth through people. Not extraordinary people, of his, uh, of normal people. Of Elijah, it says he was an ordinary person like you and I. But if we grab a glimpse of the possibilities in God, there's no telling what he can do. Do you like Hebrews 11? What is it all about? The giants of the, giants of the faith. And I began to read when I was in Bible college, I, uh, in our discipleship school, I began to read this. I love all of the stories. But when you get to the end of Hebrews 11, there is this one verse that, that wrecked the whole Months of reading that passage in the stories and being inspired. Because Hebrews 11, if you take it in its full context, it is all of the stories of the giants of faith are merely an invitation for you and I. It's not a storytelling because the stories are already in the Old, in the Old Testament. Right? It's not retelling the stories. It's merely making mention by faith Abraham, by faith Enoch, by faith Moses, just mentioning their names that by faith they entered into incredible stories with God. But the chapter ends with saying that God has given something so much better for us, parentheses, in Christ. That they may not be made perfect apart from us. It's a profound statement. After using the entire chapter to highlight the giants of the faith. Some of you are checking your, does it really say that? After using the entire chapter to highlight your favorite, our favorite giants of the faith. It ends with saying now. Everybody say now. That's 2023. Now, God having provided something better for us in Christ, that these giants of the faith, their stories, their testimonies, remain unfulfilled apart from us. We think when we get to heaven, we're going to meet David and, and I was going to say Goliath, David and... <laughs> And Moses and Elijah, right? All these amazing people. But when we get to heaven, they're going to be waiting to see you. You don't believe me? Because they want, when we walk into heaven, they're going to ask you, brother, what did, Moses is going to come and say, what did it feel like for the Holy Spirit of God? Are you kidding me? He's probably going to just pass out just thinking about it. For the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of you. That God having provided something so much better for us that they may not be made perfect apart from us. So this morning's invitation and encouragement, word of encouragement for you as a church is to come out of the ordinary mindset. Even though you may be living, you know, our lives are ordinary. True. True. No matter what you do, or it's normal lives. But if you connect your heart to God's heart, if you connect your spirit to His, inwardly we begin to realize we are part of something much bigger. Much bigger. Thank you, Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 12, it says, So concerning the last days, what manner of people are we to be? And it says two things, in holy conduct and hastening the day of the Lord. 
Peter is encouraging us that in the last days, what manner, what is the nature of the body of Christ? One, to live in holy conduct. And number two, to live in such a way that we help to hasten his return. Is that even possible? We live in such a way that we are part of the storytelling of God. And I believe this is why Jesus said, no one knows the hour except the Father. But the Father is looking all across the earth to find worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Who are connecting spirit to spirit. Just like Jesus walk, I only do what I see my Father doing. Or what I see my Father saying. What I hear my Father saying. What he's saying is not that he doesn't know, but the time when he's going to return perhaps depends on how engaged we are in advancing. It's, maybe it's not a time that he's coming. It's how quickly we advance the kingdom of God to that point. At one point, he's going to look at Newport Church and say, you guys are part of it. Jesus, come on, get to the door. We're about to leave. That's the way I want to live. I want to live in such a way that I am part of the hastening of the return of the Lord. I don't want to mess with your eschatology on my first day here. It would be my only time here. We have a, in our, our ministry, it's a Messianic Jewish missional ministry. We... Um, we have these black bands. I'm not wearing them today. I don't know if any of my kids have them. We have these black bands that we wear all of our community. And on that band is the coordinates of the Mount of Olives. And then our GBI, our, our ministry's letters. This is what we're living for. We're living for with hopeful anticipation that we want to live in such a way to do our part of the great and awesome story of God on the earth that we are part of that day when he arrives on the Mount of Olives. That's the hope. That's the nature of hope that we need to live in as families, individual families. Thank you, Lord. This morning is this weekend, Friday night and yesterday in the Jewish calendar. It was a celebration of Rosh Hashanah, which in, in the Hebraic calendar is the beginning of the new year. And it's, it's connected to this, fest, this feast called Yom Teruah, which means the day of the blast of the trumpet. And it's the first of the fall feasts, and it's a prophetic. All of the feasts in the scriptures, where I don't want to get sidetracked, all the feasts are prophetic in its, in its yearly celebration, but it also is prophetic for the redemptive plan of God. It was on Passover that Jesus was crucified. It was on Shavuot, or Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit came. They didn't know when, but they knew when. And when Yeshua, Jesus, returns... He's going to come with what? With a trumpet blast. When do you think it might be again? Oh, man, I'm getting into so much trouble here. So do I know when? I don't know when. <laughs> but I have a suspicion that it could be on a weekend just like this. On Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Teruah. So I want to come into your community and just shout. The word of encouragement to your life and to have elevate you and continue to elevate your lives from mundane to significance in the hand of God. Thank you, Lord. Where everything that we do has meaning. Your church fund and your church building and the wall, it has meaning. In God, it has meaning. We think we're engaging in our plan for the church, but in, in, the, in the eyes of heaven, it has significant. Somehow in the mystery of God, he says, oh, that works so well with what I'm planning to do. It's amazing. I'm here in the U.S. I came in 1993. I came to the U.S. because my sister visited Messiah College for a conference with her husband, and ran into a young Indian boy who was from India, the same place that I am. He speaks the same language. He grew up in Dubai, and now he's a psychologist, and he was shining with the light of God. He thought he was taking a walk in the afternoon. But there was destiny moments, not even for him, for somebody else who was still in the other, literally the other side of the world. There's no telling what God can do through our lives if we simply, merely make ourselves available to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I just want to pray over you guys in this transition for Merle and Cherie. God, we thank you for these, these months of eager anticipation of a it's, not a, it's not a new season, it's a new era for Dove International. God, I thank you for all that you have done until now. God, I thank you for the, the, the rich legacy, the rich inheritance from, from Pastor Kreider and, and, the, and the elders in the past seasons that has brought them to this point. We bless Dove International. And I just feel for you guys that you're going to be like yeast into the storyline of Dove. And it's not what you do, it's who you are. Yeast, you don't need to know what the yeast does. But you know that as soon as you put yeast, it begins to activate something. What if what has been established in this amazing stretch of the favor of God through, through, throughout nations and continents. What if all of those are merely ingredients for you to be inserted into the dough of dove as catalysts? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So on Rosh Hashanah, I want to speak to you. Happy new, happy new yeast. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And once yeast is added, it begins to activate. Don't worry. Don't be concerned about you are a change agent, not for the reason, not for the sake of change, but this is your nature. Who you are will bring the increase. Not what you do, who you are will bring the catalytic increase to Dove. I bless you. I bless Dove in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So I want to talk today quickly about history makers. And as you're coming into a new season, I want to go back to the passage in scriptures where the church was birthed. And often we go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 was in part the, 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 the in, incoming of the Holy Spirit and the start of the church in that way. But it was more fully the culmination of the messianic promises through Yeshua for a whole nation. And then he says, I'm going so that the promise will come to you. 120 Jewish people gathered in the upper room. And when they made a lot of noise with the Holy Spirit, there were thousands of other Jewish people who had gathered from around the nations. This is what it says in Acts chapter 2. Who had gathered and they heard the sound. So it's still a Jewish thing. The New Testament nations represented church had not started yet. It had begun in, that, in, that, in the sense that the Holy Spirit came. But it was still the culmination of the prophetic promises to Israel as a nation. It isn't until Acts chapter 10. It's one of the most understated and seemingly insignificant passages, but it is the beginning of the modern day or church era, the New Testament church era. And it features two people. I want to quickly run through them. The first one we see in the story is Cornelius. And it says in verse 1, And there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. And this is what was said of him in heaven. A devout man who feared God with all his household. Who gave, here two things. Who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Generosity and prayer were the two things his name was known in heaven for. Not his accolades as a soldier or a general or a leader in the, in the Italian army. He was a devout man outside of Israel, outside of the commonwealth of Israel. He prayed to God and he gave generously to the house of God. So perhaps your church funding, your church building is part of God's design and we don't even know it. Perhaps our generosity of heart is part of God's design and part of his testimony about you in heaven. It says a memorial came up in heaven about you. How would you? Memorials usually talked about people when they die. How about living on earth with a testimony on the earth and a living memorial in heaven on your behalf? I don't know if angels can stand still when there's that kind of connection between heaven and earth. So this is a picture of, of Cornelius. And it says, You're, it has come up as a memorial before God. And then the other person in the story in another city is Peter. And he's praying. Cornelius was praying as well. 
And Peter was praying on a rooftop, and both of them begin to see a vision. In the vision for Cornelius, the angel came and said, go and get Peter. And in the vision for Peter, a Jewish man, he gets an unusual vision of a big sheet with tons of non-kosher animals. And he hears a voice. It says he was in a vision, in a trance. I don't know how that works in our belief system. In a trance, he hears a voice. And when we read this passage, that voice is in red letters. In a trance, Jesus appears and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. This voice and this instruction to Peter comes against every single thing he knows about faith and godliness in his life. As a devout Jewish man, he gets a vision in a trance that Jesus is speaking to him. Peter, you can eat these animals now. This is setting up to start the New Testament church. All of, I mean, Peter's not even a theologian to start with. All of his understanding as a fisherman is now being tested. None of his guys are with him. They're all in Antioch. None of his team, none of the other apostles are with him. He's by himself, gets a vision, a trance. Jesus speaks, you can eat these unclean animals. And it says later, while he was pondering what this dream meant, Cornelius had sent his men, and it says there was a knock on his door. Sometimes we don't even have to figure it out before God is already wanting to use you. Sometimes we're stuck in, well, this can't be the Lord because it doesn't work with what I know of how faith and life and godliness and church and everything should work. So it's not the Lord. Do you know what was, what was Peter's credibility in this story? He says, this doesn't make any sense. Mm, but that voice, I can't deny. Peter, follow me. Jesus, is that you? Everyone else is saying it's a ghost. That was their highest theological <laughs> computation of that moment. And Peter says, if it's you, call me to come out. His, that's what faith looks like. It's never sure. Faith is not a mountaintop experience in our humble opinion. Faith for our experience looks like this. God, I need this. Why does this look like, feel like you though? Why does this sound like you? But it doesn't make sense in my life at all. Come on. So while he was thinking what this could mean, there was a knock on his door. And they said, Cornelius has asked for you. So he is now walking the next day. They journey together to meet Cornelius. I can imagine Peter walking, saying, and it says in this, in this text that it wasn't allowed for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile's home. And on top of that, he is going to now preach the gospel, which will later unfold. And so he's trying to figure out theological understanding of his own history, of his own faith, and his own relationship with his brothers in the faith, the apostles. And he's walking, poor guy. One thing for Peter, God was probably thinking, he's probably the only idiot who would do such a thing. True? Sometimes we have to be like that. Simple. Simple. Not complicated. Simple. That we would dare say, b dare believe this could be the Lord. I mean, think about it. It goes against every Jewish understanding of very basic day-to-day, -day, everyday life of kosher, eating kosher food. But Peter says, it must be the Lord. It must be the Lord. He walks into Cornelius' house. They begin to interact, and he shares his vision. Peter shares his vision, and he says, what should I do? And he says, begins to preach the gospel. And it says, as he was preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell on the, in, in Cornelius' house. You don't even need to have the whole message prepared. You don't even need to have the whole thing planned out. As he, God didn't even need him to have a fully rounded, you know, 
theological understanding to preach the gospel in the house of a Gentile. God just wanted obedience and availability. And um, a good measure of foolishness. Three good ingredients for God to use us. And he finds himself by himself in a Gentile's house, not allowed, with a vision, not allowed, preaching the gospel, not allowed. Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles, not allowed. Poor guy. He's thinking while he's preaching, well, I could come in, I'll come in, I'll preach. And then we can just go. No one needs to know this. And as he's preaching, the whole, wait, 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 don't do this. <laughs> Till now I had figured out, I'll, these are my excuses, but I, I can't. How am I going to explain this? The next chapter, the first few verses, it says, When Peter eventually returned to Antioch, they heard rumors. They said, Peter, what was going on? We heard some rumors. And Peter's trying to describe this. And well, what had happened was I was there on the rooftop. And I was fasting and praying. It was hot. And I, I, I fell asleep. And I had a, a vision or dream. And, and then I, had a, I was in a trance. It was not going well for Peter. <laughs> and in a trance, Jesus spoke to me. And what did he say? Well, he showed me all these unclean animals. <laughs> what, we, what we heard was right. And then he said, Peter, rise, kill. And then what? Well, eat. And you know what it says in very biblical language? And all of them contended with Peter. This is the, guys, this is the birth of the New Testament church. Nobody understood him. Nobody understood the simple pursuit and availability that Peter's heart had postured himself from the very beginning, so much so that it was against their own doctrinal understanding. How do you, how do, you do that? What is that? What would that look like today? I don't even want to know. <laughs> oh, Lord, I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> and they contended with him. They probably had a fight. That's a biblical way of saying they had a fight. God is birthing the New Testament church into the nations. And they're fighting about it. Because it doesn't make sense. Woo. And I know Peter is significant. But what about Cornelius? Why is he chosen? Why is his house chosen to be the first Gentile household? That would receive the gospel of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit would fall. It's even more, dare I say, even more significant than the upper room. Whoa. Look at that. All of that is because of that moment in Acts chapter 10. Who is this Cornelius? Who is this centurion? I'm reminded of another centurion in scriptures. Perhaps it could be. Could it be? It could. I don't know. Word had gotten around when Jesus was ministering that if you came close to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment, you could be made whole. This was a rumor in town all over Israel. There's this guy. He's a prophet. We, don't, we can't figure him out. But what we do know is that those people that come and touch him get healed. And this is the established faith of Israel of that time concerning Jesus who is in ministry. If you touch him, you get healed. This is an established, well-known, recognized level of faith in the land at that time. And here are some, here are some passages in Mark 6, 54. 54 or 55 onwards. And when they came out of the boat, Jesus and his disciples, immediately the people recognized him and ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard that Jesus was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, count, uh, country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment as many touched him were healed. So this was a commonly established faith in Israel among Jewish people concerning Jesus. 
It is in the same understanding that the woman with the issue of blood presses in because she heard the same rumor. If you can touch him, you'll be made whole. She said, I have nothing to lose. That's how her story unfolds. She presses through the crowd. And what does she do? Touches the hem of his garments. This is the same story that friends had heard that they brought their friend who was sick in a bed to a house where they heard Jesus was. It wasn't enough to stand outside in the overflow room. They had to get in, but there was no way. But they said, we have to get him in there so that he can touch Jesus and be made whole. And we know the story. They broke through the, the roof and lowered their friend. Because that was the established level of faith in the land at that time. And then there was another encounter that changed everything. Jesus in Matthew 8, there are several references to this. Now, when Jesus had entered, uh, Matthew 8, 5 onwards, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is dying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Come on. Jesus is saying to you, I'll come to your house and heal your... That, because that was what Jesus expected, because that was the expectation of the hearts of the entire nation. If you come and you, get, you touch him, you'll get healed. And Jesus in red letters says, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. That you should come to my house. Just say the word. And my servant will be healed. Something in this centurion who was not part of the commonwealth of Israel. Saw past the established faith of the church of that day. And he said, you don't need to come to my house. I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. I know. I have a sense of who you are. He went past the mechanics to the person. He says, you just say the word. And you know what Jesus says of him? Assuredly, I say to you in verse 10, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Wow. He finds a man outside of the commonwealth of Israel with faith that doesn't match the commonly expected faith of the land. He says, don't, don't come to my house. Just say the word. I can imagine Jesus in that moment saying, I have found. I found one. From among the nations. You say I shouldn't come to your house. Not only will I come into your house, but the gospel will go through your house to the nations of the world. This is an invitation this morning for us. We can live with common expectation of faith. Jesus actually celebrated it. To all of them, he said, your faith has made you whole. 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 Oh, I have never seen faith like this. We can be content and fulfill the plan of God for our lives. It's not negative. Jesus actually celebrated all of that until he found one through which he could advance the purposes of God. Thank you, Lord. I don't want to settle. I don't want to settle for church faith. I love the church. I love the body of Christ. I don't want to settle for Dove International faith. I love Dove International, India. I don't want to settle for life center faith. I want to believe. I want to believe like no one has ever believed before. Oh, 
I want to believe God. Like no, oh, Chandi, come on. 2,000 years, we have used up all of the belief levels. He is endless. He's unsearchable. Unsearchable. The measure of faith that we can believe him is endless. He's just looking. He's looking throughout the earth who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Worship team, you're welcome to come up. This is an invitation for you as a church. In this, in this time of transition, in this season of trans, significant era shifting transition, it's like for you, it's like the, the act between Acts 2 and Acts 10 moment. This is a prophetic season for you. You're caught in the storytelling of something being fulfilled and something coming into its new expression. It's going to take two things. One, that you, ha you will dare to believe the voice of Jesus like Peter at the cost of everything he knows. Two, you will have simplicity of heart in prayer, generosity like Cornelius, and have faith that has not been seen here before. And this is not just a call for your leaders. This is a call for every single family. They can't transition into the new era. On, it's, not a, it's not a singular transition for you as a body. It is, uh, as, as a church, it is a corporate, it's a corporate, it's a corporate advancing into a new Forget season. It's a corporate advancing into a new era. This is going to impact. This has a potential to impact every family. Thank you, Lord. So I want to stir your anticipation of this season. This is not them walking into their destiny moment. This is your company, your community, your church, your body, your ministry coming into something new all together. So elevate your faith. Break out of all of the shackles. We were singing, break every chain. Break out those things. Move into unreasonable expectation in the Lord. Come on. If 200,000 is your budget, what if it, they haven't asked me to say anything about the bill. I'm just inspired by it because Cornelius was known for his generosity and his prayers. Thank you, Lord. That you would have a generous vision that stretches across the continents of the earth. How much more is God desiring to do here among you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. If this is you, and your family, I don't know what's normal here, but I want to invite you to come out of your seats and say, God, make a physical statement. I want to be like Peter. I want to be like Cornelius. I want to live in an uncomfortable reality between heaven and earth, that reality which advances the kingdom of God forward for me and our people. Thank you, Lord. So if that's you, I want to invite you to come up. Make a statement, a bold statement together as a church, family after family. There's ministry teams here that'll, that'll simply encourage your heart and your faith. Come on up. Thank you, Lord. What area in your life is so ingrained in personal, family, spiritual culture that you want to let go of and say, God, fully abandoned to your purposes. Let us be like Cornelius and Peter. Let us be that unusual partnership on the earth where you advanced your gospel, your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. You're on the verge of a new era here at Dove. What area are you contending with and not letting go? What culture, what, what Pennsylvania culture are you holding on to? What Pennsylvania culture are you holding? I'm, I don't look Pennsylvanian, but I am Pennsylvanian. I love the Eagles. Go birds. 2-0. Let's go. 
come on. If this is you, this has implications for your children. This has implications for generations to come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for watching this teaching. I hope that it impacted you in some way. If you enjoyed this teaching and would like more teachings like this, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get updated each time we post a new sermon.